Morning all. You seem to be enjoying the Capablanca game coverage in the Evolution of Style. Now this particular game is of great interest because uh, the Marshall Gambit today, named after Frank Marshall, uh, was really introduced by this game. And the Marshall Gambit is still popular today, even among you know 2,700 plus GMs. For example, um, top UK Grandmaster Michael Adams plays the Marshall Gambit a lot, you know, regularly. So the historical background, you know, I know we're talking about evolution of style, but this is like evolution of openings. There's an early version, basically, of the Marshall Gambit in this game in 1918. Historically, also, um, I should point out that um, there was a Frank Marshall match back, you know, eight years before this game in 1909 which uh, Capablanca, he defeated Marshall, he won eight, he only lost one game um, and there were 14 draws. In that 1909 match um, Capablanca noted in his uh, chess career that uh, he had no difficulty arranging the match. Marshall was disposed to play in this case uh, where he naturally discounted his victory. Yeah, of course, you know, eight years ago Marshall was the established uh, master and you know Kappa had proved himself against Frank Marshall uh, by beating him in that earlier match so this this uh, you know eight years later at um, the chess club <laughs> the Manhattan chess club which is uh, one of the two most famous um, chess clubs in uh, in New York at the moment so there's Mar Marshall and the Manhattan so Marshall got to get a club named after him as well but anyway so let's see this game. E4 was kicked off by uh, Jose Rule Capablanca. Jose Rule Capablanca? I'll, 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 I think someone said Jose Rule Capablanca. Sorry about my pronunciation. Okay. Let's, let's just call him Kappa for short, actually. <laughs> so E5 by Frank. Knight f3, knight c6. So Roy Lopez territory so far. All standard stuff in the opening here. Standard stuff, rookie one. And now there comes the point of interest. After c3, um, but this novelty now by, by Frank was very, very interesting historically. So he's sacrificing a whole pawn, a kind of early positional sacrifice to try and get a vicious attack. Okay, so he plays d5. So an early Marshall Gambit played by Frank James Marshall in 1918 against Capablanca. So Kappa took and he took on e5, not fearing Black's initiative. After knight takes, rook takes, the strongest move we discover from our research today and most often played now is the move c6 supporting that knight on d5 Frank's move is interesting but uh, it seems to give white an edge a more definite edge he retreated his knight okay so the knight plays a direct role in the attack later with knight g4s rather than offering itself to be taken by the bishop all the time. Okay, so there's quite a few different implications of this. Okay, rook e1, the rook humbly retreats, and then Marshall starts his attack. Bishop d6, there's no protector of that sensitive h2 square now that the knight's gone. Did it greedily take the e pawn, or should it have taken the e pawn? That's the big question. Okay, with h2 vulnerable, what does Kappa do first? Well, there's also ideas of knight g4, bishop g4, knight g4, and queen h4 would we'll target these two guys as well, not just this one. So the next move seems kind of logical. Prophylaxis, not developing a piece yet, not playing d4, just trying to deprive black of that, d, of that g4 square. So he plays h3. Okay. Marshall being quite an aggressive attacking player is not put off by this. He plays knight g4 anyway. 
Okay, we have some interesting stuff going on here. Let's have a quick look. I think let's turn on an engine here. So what's going on here? Why can't the knight be taken, you might ask. Let's take the knight. Queen h4 could come in. Okay, crude threats, but effective, maybe. Now here, you know, again, it's not definite, though, the attack. It's not definite even here, taking knight. Queen f3, check, check, check. It starts to look kind of dangerous. White's losing the rook on e1. It's all a bit messy. There's two vulnerabilities here in black's position. I think taking on a8 doesn't help because the bishop's also in pre and there might be other stuff as well. Um, so the only move according to Ribka is taking on f7 and then taking on e8 and then is it taking on a8? No, here just king c2 with apparently a small advantage. Now if queen takes a8 here, bishop f5 actually wins the queen because it's check and wins the queen. So actually this, this continuation might actually be pliable, believe it or not, even here. Crazy stuff, basically. So anyway, the simpler continuation, or was it, was played. So after bishop d6, h3, knight g4, instead of taking the knight, Kappa played queen f3, which is definitely stronger. It's immediately giving white an edge. This bishop's not blunted like it would be in, in the more modern variation. It's on f7 all the time. Okay, there's a8 as well, potentially, as well. So queen f3 looks like a good move. Um, so Marshall went all in, queen h4, and now d4, finally developing a bit of the queen side. This bishop's now activated. But Frank carries on his attack. There's a few ways to do this attack. Um, maybe this is a slightly inferior way of doing it. Knight takes f2, maybe technically better is bishop h2. Let's have a quick look at bishop h2. If king f1, say bishop d6, bishop f4, following, following Ribka line, bishop b7, decoy, powerful decoy. Well, actually not, not, not so, uh, so deep. If queen takes b7, queen takes f2 is mate. <laughs> so, queen takes g4, queen g4, taking on f4, this continuation, apparently white's better here as well. Slight advantage to white. So, okay. Um, in theory, you know, white should weather this attack, it seems, even if uh, this other continuation was played, bishop h2. So Frank actually chose knight takes f2, which seems dangerous as well. Um, let's have a look at the obvious queen f2. I guess bishop g3, a lovely skewer. Or not. No, this would be a mating two for black. Because queen takes f7 check. <laughs> and then rook e8 mate. So that bishop's uh, quite, kind of useful actually on the f7 pawn. So no, here the point is, what's the point here you might ask? After queen takes f2, it's not the skewer. There's a decoy available to black. Bishop h2 check. Okay, so the king moves to h1, queen f2, so king f1. And now, bishop g3 here. Bishop g3 here. So, the obvious question is, what the heck happened there? Why isn't queen f7 on? The point is that um, rook takes f7 is actually check now with that king on f1. It's check. So black would be winning here. There's no rookie 8 mate. 
because it's check. Why well, it has to do something about the check? So that's kind of sneaky, isn't it? This this idea, this whole idea. Knight takes f2. It's got some tactical genius behind it. The idea of bishop h2 check first to force king f1, and only then bishop g3. So bishop h2, bishop g3. So what would Kappa have to do here? So maybe he very wisely avoided this continuation. Now here he would be exposed to a vicious attack if queen e2. Bishop h3 looks like a vicious attack. In fact, black would be getting the better of it. His king's getting torn to shreds. So, you know, although he made this game look easy, behind the scenes, there's variations. He's, he could have got torn to shreds, as this demonstrates. And his queen side's lagging in development as well in these variations. And it could almost be munched like this, kind of horribly. So, that's to be avoided, this kind of stuff. Where where black would have loads and loads of pawns in this particular continuation. So let's go back. So knight takes f2. I was wondering if I ever tried covering this game before. I thought I had, but maybe I was off put by all the intricate variations behind the scenes. Okay. So instead of that queen takes f2, <laughs> with the idea that black not, not plays bishop g3 because of queen f7, but actually plays bishop h2 first, with that uh, very tactical sharp continuation. No, actually Kappa here accepts black's just munched his f2 pawn, kind of coldly and clinically just uh, doesn't react emotionally, just, just plays a very logical move. In fact, one of the strongest moves according to Ribka, the second choice move, even today, depth 13. With rookie 3 being technically apparently the best, but rookie 2, okay. So rookie 2, with the option of taking the knight with the rook. The, the attack continues now. Frank plays bishop g4. Okay, so if takes... Well, Kappa did take. What other opportunities are there to do anything? Well, he could take on f2 with the queen. Let's have a quick look at that. Bishop g3. Why can't, say, might play queen e3? You might ask. Well, bishop takes. And now rook a e8. And look at this. This queen side is, is lagging in development. And black's now threatening like, rook e1. It'll be, it'll be actually crushing. If bishop e3, queen e4 is a strong move. Nasty. You know, white's collapsing on that e-file. So in this position, he's, he's going to be much worse. Is the exchange down, and his queen side's still under fire as well. So that's to be avoided. So after bishop g4, Kappa just takes on g4. So that's the strongest move. Great decision. Okay, the game continues. Bishop h2, check. And now bishop g3 with uh, not so subtle threat now of queen h1 mate. So Kappa takes on f2, giving his king an escape route maybe. Whoops. An escape route like this. Check. After bishop takes f2. Now not the routine taking on f2 here. This, believe it or not, guys, is what Ribka thinks is the strongest move in this position. What Capablanca played in 1918. In this position, well, I don't know, may maybe it's just logical. The Queen's attacking the Bishop. Okay, the Bishop could have gone uh, to maybe G5 as well. I was just thinking, you know, taking here is also an option one would consider. But um, Kappa was wise not to allow Queen takes c1. So he plays the strongest move in the position. Let's have a quick look at Queen takes f2. So Queen takes c1, actually, technically, black's going to be better from this analysis. This e file, again, is very, very dangerous. Just to get a gist of it, 
of the elements here. The E file is dangerous. The queen side still lacking development. So black can try and share, shred the white king to pieces here with C5. And it starts to look a bit nasty. C4 now is a threat. If white has to give up the rook, obviously that's completely lost. So the move uh, Kappa played calmly here was bishop d2. Okay, keeping that threat on the f2 bishop. The bishop finally moves. A sign of potential defeat if he has to start moving backwards. Now queen h3 repelling, it seems, the black attack. But there's a check on the e file. Is the e file not still dangerous? King d3, queen f1 check. The king tucks itself neatly now on c2. Sunlight at last. It's looking brighter for Capablanca's uh, position. But what of his queen side development? How is he going to develop the rook? Bishop f2. Okay, what else could black do here? His attack doesn't seem to have anything concrete. There's no clear path, it seems here. White's just better, basically. So a4 is soon how the, the white rook will develop. So first this queen f3, which provokes queen g1. Now why does it provoke queen g1, you might ask. If, if say, I move like h6, well, with the bishop being unable to move, what can black do? He can't do anything active here. In fact, bishop d5 is a good good move. And then a4. And what what is black doing now in this position? It's kind of hard to continue. So after this queen f3, okay, the natural reaction is to unpin. So it was queen g1 was played. Also gives possibilities then of, of bishop e1. Now Capablanca plays uh, bishop d5. Okay, so bishop d5. What does bishop d5 do? It protects indirectly g2, so the queen might be free to move in some lines now, keeping g2. c5, trying to shred, shred the white king in the center. But Capablanca takes. After bishop takes c5, now gets a tempo with b4 and a grip on c5. And this pawn, believe it or not, <laughs> funny enough, it would seem like a, an odd joke to make in this position, that this pawn's going to play a critical role in white actually winning this game from this position. A position where he seems to have very awkward queenside development. So bishop d6, and now a4. And here is where White's really systematically increasing his own advantage. That bishop on d5 is very, very useful, really, striking out, attacking, and defending indirectly. And also eyeing a8 as well. Could be herding that pawn. Doing a lot on d5. This knight's also useful, protecting d2 and the d file generally. So the, the worries are over. a5, this starts to look like desperation, giving White a very dangerous b pawn which I know from personal experience recently can actually win the game, just, just the past B pawn. So A takes B5, A takes B4, Rook A6. Okay, he's letting Black help develop his Queen's Knight if, if taking on C3. If the Bishop now moves, let's give the Bishop a token move back. What would have happened? Well, just c takes b4 might be safe enough, and then knight c3 anyway. Okay. Or maybe even just c4. Two connected past pawns. No need to be greedy. Is b3 that strong? With the bishop protecting g2, maybe just queen takes b3 here. It's fine. Good advantage for white. So this is starting to look uh, a bit grim. The rook's getting into the game. Frank took on c3, knight takes c3, white's completing his development. The rook on c6 also provides support for the c6 square as well, just in case the c file is dangerous later. 
Bishop b4, now b6, the pawn relentlessly goes forward. That's another point, probably the main point, in fact, behind rook a6, is to drive this pawn forward one more square without being munched by that queen distantly on g1. Okay, this spells disaster, this pawn, combined with white's pressure on the king side here. Frank took on c3 and played h6, but now the pawn relentlessly goes forward again. And look, the bishop's also eyeing indirectly the a8 square, not just the g2 one. Through these pieces, it's, it's having a great effect for rook a8 being supported, for that pawn being exceptionally dangerous. One last threat, maybe, from Frank, rook e3, but it's finally refuted now. I wonder if you can spot the refutation. If I give you 20 seconds, or if you want to stop the video, to try and find this last crushing move from the great Kappa in this classic game. Okay, so I'll pause now. Okay, brilliant move here. Bishop takes f7. So what's going on here, you might ask? Right, if king h8, then can you spot the winning move here, if I give you 10 seconds? There'll be rook takes h6, and that's mate, because of that pin on the pawn. So that's not pliable. If king h7, can you spot the continuation? 10 seconds? Queen f5 check is crushing. And then if g6 just just mate. So let's go on to uh, rook takes f7. Ten seconds here. You just uh, just queen the pawn, and that's that's all over. Let me mating again. Okay, so there's nothing here. Um, this this is gone. This is it. Bishop f7. End of game. Let's have a look in that game in overview and summary. So it was a uh, weathering a storm, very powerful storm, an early martial gambit, which has impacted. Well, it's been one of the, one of the most respected and enduring gambits to one e4, and has actually influenced the style of top grandmasters even nowadays for all these anti kind of martial systems being developed like d freeze instead of c3 and then a4 so a lot of anti martial systems uh stemming really from this 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 introduction by Frank Marshall of the martial gambit apparently Apparently, the gambit had been played in a few obscure games, including a consultation game in Havana uh, before this game. But there's no evidence to show that Marshall knew of these games. So maybe he had actually introduced it just for Kappa. So an early aggressive positional sacrifice, really, giving up that e pawn to get rid of White's defender of the sensitive h2 square. But also the h4 square, if a queen's coming into h4, it's hitting a lot of vulnerabilities in white's king. So it shows anyway that Kappa is a fine uh, defender on the receiving end of a vicious gambit. c6, yes, we know now it's, it's technically stronger. And put the bishop on this diagonal, hitting h2, not, not to f6. So the idea of this game is, is slightly different, using the f6 square as the pivot for the knight. Okay. Okay, the bishop still comes to this diagonal anyway. But knight g4, so it looks as though, yeah, why not use the knight like this? So queen f3, calm stuff, with all the black resources coming in around squares around the king. So f2, h2, under fire, the diagonal looks a bit weak as well. This lagging development, this bishop not able to do much, this knight's quite a distance away, d4 would have to be played first. So it's just the queen alone. And the e-file is also at black's disposal for, for e-file pressure to exploit this lagging development. So there's a few factors here. This, this attack's more vicious than it, than it might seem. So d4, knight takes f2. Very, very clever stuff now. Uh, 
because Queen F2, I hope Frank wasn't playing Bishop G3, because then there's Queen F7, that would be kind of funny. So we have a, a, a more uh, more meaningful game now, because Kappa didn't test that, um, and I, that wouldn't have been played. Surely Bishop H2 and then Bishop G3 was the idea, anyway. So, so Rook E2, okay, and now Bishop G4. Vicious attack, really, isn't it? So inviting the checks. So bishop g3. Now taking the knight. Well, he has to parry queen h1, mate. Check. So he's offering the c1 bishop as well. But bishop f2 first. Threatening also queen e1. Which is why actually bishop g5 is not really a move. Uh, coming to think about it, sorry I didn't spot that earlier, guys. But bishop g5, I think queen e1 looks dangerous. Or is it? There's king d3, only move. So it's not that. In fact, bishop g5 might actually be playable. Check. Let's not get into another labyrinth, though. Okay, so it's immensely complicated variations. So let's go back to bishop d2. Overview and summary after all. Now, so the attack starting to be repelled. The king's finding a nice pigeonhole, cozy little square c2. Classic. The bishop's got a very powerful role here on d5 for every segment of the board. f7, g2, a8, c6. Beautiful bishop on d5. Which is allowed to be there now. There's no, no kicking moves available from the black pawns after c5 is played. So now white unravels and that b pawn rears its ugly head now from the black perspective for being a very dangerous asset to win this game. The b pawn is pivotal to winning this game. Why didn't I revise this game before my last over the board game? Oh dear. These dangerous b-pawns driven by rooks on a6s as well. So there's no slowing it down at the moment. Bishop gives itself up. Maybe to try and loosen white's control of the queen side a bit. But it relentlessly goes forward, cutting out any rook c8s as well. There's no attack to speak of. And now after rook e3, did this carry with it a glimmer of hope? Well, it was all crushed now, that, that hope, with this next move, bishop takes f7. So, <laughs> that was uh, a classic encounter between Kappa and Frank Marshall. Okay, comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.